I'm Brian Barnett. I'm just a regular guy. I'm not a doctor. I have no legal license in any field of psychology. But I did live a large part of my life with borderline personality disorder unknowingly. And I really did rid myself of the disorder completely and permanently. Through that, I've become an expert on issues involving emotional health. I accept no responsibility whatsoever for your feelings, thoughts, behaviors, decisions, and actions, including your decision to watch or listen to this show at all. But I do hope you might benefit yourself from the insights I share. Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome back to The Last Symptom. I'm Brian Barnett, the creator and host of The Last Symptom. It's so nice to have you back with me again this week. It's not actually Thursday. It's Friday, and you'll probably, the earliest you'll probably be able to hear this is Saturday. Forgive me, I, uh, I've been sick. Actually, I went on this big backpacking trip last week and uh, big long uh, excursion through the mountains and uh, there was a guy that was I took a, I took some newbies <laughs> some first timers and uh, the guy who went with us uh, was complaining about a cold so I might have picked it up from him but I also might have picked it up from my own daughter she had a cold and uh <clears throat> It was the last, last couple days, last two, three, four days. It just seemed like I could not catch up to my rest. I'd get up, I'd do some things, and it was just like I needed to to sleep some more. Well, today it caught up to me. You know, it's just I feel pretty drained. Anyway, it was tempting to not do a show this, this week, but uh, I did not want to let too much time go by before we we did this again i know that there's plenty of yins out there who look forward to the show and i appreciate that you might hear uh, some sounds in the background as usual on a nice night i've got my door open got six pups now had seven Ooh, somebody carried away one of them today but man you talk about a big job there that's a that's a big job taking care of a handful of, of pups when they get to this age they're at eight weeks old and they're just uh, bundles of energy, I tell you. They never stop. Somebody the other day said, hey, could you get a picture of this one pup for me? And I said, well, I'll try. Got out there and, you know, you know you know how it is. It's just click. You look at the picture, it's just a, a blur. So then you do another picture, click. Look at the picture, it's just a blur. Even when you think you got them dead to rights. Click, blur. So... You know, I've, I've been putting in and out a lot of energy lately, but I am excited. I've had some good conversations here recently, and I thought that I would share some of those conversations. Um, you know, Caesar Balan, the dog whisperer, uh, speaking of pups, I've got them in a playpen right now, and they're not too happy about that. They, they want to be playing with me, and they want to be out in the yard and stuff like that. I said, you guys got to be in that playpen until I get this show out of the way so if you hear yelping and I mean it'll sound like they're dying it'll sound like somebody's yanking their toenails out with pliers trust me they're perfectly fine they're in a really nice play spot they just don't want to be there but uh, Cesar Milan talks about working with dogs a lot and he talks about things in terms of energy and uh, I've told a few folks here recently that I'm going to go to referring to it more like that the more of the things that we talk about here in terms of energy I think I was talking to somebody about this the other day and I referred to it in terms of bad energy and good energy I shouldn't have done that I shouldn't have done that because it contradicts what I'm always saying that feelings can't be good or bad right or wrong so a better way of referring to it would be like positive energy and negative energy negative energy would be somebody who's combative or insecure or um, argumentative uh, which I reckon is the same as combative you gotta forgive me I'm trying to get my, my mind into the game here and I got lots of distractions but instead of bad energy and good energy I think positive energy and negative energy is the way to go but you know in the past we have talked about how 
um, emotions are energy. Have you ever like really got upset? It's um, you really got into an argument and uh, just really, really angry, really angry. And afterwards, when you come down off that, what do you feel? Oh, depleted, don't you? Depleted. That's why it's uh, appropriate to think of emotions in terms of energy. Everything's energy. I mean, if I walk across the yard, that's energy. If I uh, if I choose to read something, that's energy I'm using up. If I uh, plug in a, a podcast or I turn on YouTube and I watch a, a podcast on YouTube or Rumble like you're doing now, that's energy. And the interesting thing is that there's a finite amount of it. Do you take that into consideration for yourself? That you have a finite amount of it, and then are you particular about where your energy goes to? I usually am. Not always. Sometimes I don't care. But most of the time, most of the time I am uh, conscious and aware of where I'm allowing my energy to go. Now, I was talking to somebody who has kids, is in a relationship where he figures, uh, you know, the wife is not really trying to work on herself and he is and they've got children he's concerned about the effect of that now if you're in a similar situation here's what I want to tell you I want you to think about things in terms of energy and I'd like you to imagine that you're your child watching you and your partner or your wife or your husband and I'm always remember, reminded when I think about this of uh, the last, like, what is it, the last 15 minutes of uh, Star Wars, A New Hope. Do you remember that uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, played by Alc Guinness, confronts Darth Vader on this ship? And this is the scene where the, the they duel with their lightsabers. And Alec Guinness plays a very nice Jedi, right? He's a very calm and collected and very calm, assertive character in that movie. Uh, And Darth Vader is very menacing. Now, if you're thinking about that scene in terms of energy, how would you describe Obi-Wan Kenobi or Alec Guinness in his big, long, earthy, tannish robe with his lightsaber confronting Darth Vader? Uh, how would you describe his energy and how would you describe Darth Vader's energy well Darth Vader is very menacing he's uh, dark and and sort of uh, menacing I, I reckon is the best term I can come up with right now <laughs> feel like I feel <clears throat> by contrast what is uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi's energy like it's very measured and controlled, isn't it? He's not going crazy. He's, he's He seems very calm and collected and in control. It, it makes me ask myself, well, first of all, when I'm in the theater and I'm watching that, or I'm watching on my big screen TV at home, which character on the screen am I more naturally drawn to and who am I uh, more naturally interested in being or emulating myself which energy is more attractive I reckon is the question well for me it's Obi-Wan Kenobi he's not angry he's not yelling he's not screaming he seems very in control even though he ends up getting struck down by Darth Vader of the two of them Obi-Wan seems the one seems to be the cooler of the two cats He seems very calm and collected. So my question is, as you as an observer, which person or character do you admire more? Which will leave the strongest impression? So now I want you to think about a child watching two parents. And one parent is uh, emotionally unhealthy, not working on herself or himself has no interest in working on himself or herself and there is some kind of conflict within the family a lot of folks think well it's just a lose-lose situation then like my kids are going to be exposed to just the nastiest stuff 
and it's going to affect them for the rest of their life. And what I would like to say is not necessarily, not necessarily, not necessarily, as long as you can be the positive energy going up against the negative energy, and they can witness that. So just like me in the movie theater when I'm a little boy watching Star Wars and I'm rooting in my heart for Obi-Wan Kenobi and and I'm impressed by his calm, assertive, collected um, manner. And that leaves a stronger impression on me than Darth Vader with all of his minute in all of his menacing ways. Which character are you going to channel? You know, because Darth Vader would be the negative energy and Obi-Wan Kenobi would be the positive energy. Which energy are you going to channel? So, a lot of parents think that because there's one parent who is unhealthy and behaves in unhealthy ways and negative ways and all this stuff, that their children are just going to negative, are automatically going to be negatively impacted by that. And my response to that is not necessarily. Not as long as the other parent can be the positive energy in front of that negative energy. Because one of these days, those children, your children, are going to grow up and they're going to go out into the real world, aren't they? So it's interesting that this scenario where you've got a healthy parent who masterfully always confronts negative energy with positive energy in a calm assertive way Uh, the interesting thing is that those children growing up viewing that might actually be at an advantage over children who grow up with just two parents who are healthy all the time why is that because children grow up and they go out into the real world and what is the real world full of it's full of negative energy how do you learn how to deal with negative energy in in the people out there in the world well children who have grown up seeing a parent masterfully do this all the time are they will already know how to do it they'll already be equipped and prepared won't they and remember which leaves the greater impression it's the positive energy the positive energy coming up against negative energy always leaves a stronger impression don't believe me well how come in movies especially uh, like uh, Asian movies you know like uh, ch- uh, Chinese movies why is the person you're always rooting for the most common collected like the bad guy is like throwing things around smashing things t- trash in the place in a fury that he can't kill the good guy and the good guy is what the good guy is just calm and collected confident measured it's because we as human beings, we, we're drawn to that. We're drawn to that. It leaves a, a great impression on us. So much so that our heroes all exemplify that type of character. One other thing, uh, when I was talking to this person about, this is unrelated to energy, sort of. It's unrelated to the idea that, you know, an Obi-Wan Kenobi type person displaying that type of energy will have a great positive effect on observers. But we were talking about how when I was unhealthy, I always thought that the answer to not being abusive was to walk around not trying to abuse people. Throughout my recovery, I realized that healthy people aren't doing this. Healthy people aren't trying not to be abusive. That was kind of a, an epiphany for me. Healthy people aren't walking around trying not to be abusive. But I remember what it was like when it's before. You see, you're just trying to superficial restrain, superficially restrain yourself from being abusive. And um, while I was talking to this fella, I remember what that was like. It, it's like holding your breath. <laughs> it, that's what it's like when you're unhealthy and you don't want to abuse people. You really don't want to abuse them. It's like walking around holding your breath and it's unsustainable but you can imagine you holding your breath and trying to go about your day 
do things, you know, take care of tasks, take care of this and take care of that while holding your breath the whole time. Your, your mind is never completely off of holding your breath, is it? So you can't really concentrate on, you can't really give anything else your full attention if that's what you're doing, walking around trying not to be abusive. The answer, of course, is not to hold your breath. That's not how you, you beat being an abusive person. The answer instead is to figure out what sorts of thinking and perspectives and attitudes do you live with that allow you to be abusive. You have to address those. You have to identify it and address those. And once you do, well then, the natural result of that is that you don't abuse people because you have, you have no tendency or inclination to abuse people. But as long as you're walking around and it's like you're holding your breath, that inclination is still there. The inclination, the tendency is still there. You have to you have to find out why that tendency is there, which goes back to your perspectives. Find out which perspectives you live with that allow for that and identify them, eliminate them. And then you won't have to walk around holding your breath anymore. All right. Before we go on, let's do some announcements. I've been kind of lax about that lately. TheLastSymptom.com my website full free and paid resources that I hope you will take advantage of. Of course, the probably the finest paid resources I have available at thelastsymptom.com is The Last Symptom Fundamentals Course. It's a two-week pre-recorded course, video course, which lays down a, the foundation for you to authentically recover from your emotional disorder. A lot of people still think I... It's, I'm sitting here just talking about borderline personality disorder. I am not. I'm talking about all emotional disorders. They are all rooted in the exact same thing, which means the solutions are all the exact same thing. So the last symptom fundamentals course is no different than it's, you know, you could take it on your own time, uh, but it is complete. It is very thorough. You just ask anybody who's taken it in the past. Uh, our online group, our online community is exclusively on the locals platform. You can join us by going to thelastsymptom.locals.com or you can download the locals.com app from the App Store and join us by going in there and searching for The Last Symptom by Brian Barnett. We traditionally do live streams every Monday. I haven't done one for a couple weeks now because of things going on in my life, but I've got some good things planned for this Monday, so be sure to join us. Anything else? Let's see. Let's get on with it. Distinctions. I've learned in my own recovery and in, over the years helping other people that uh, one major aspect of emotional disorder or emotional unhealth is the failure to make distinctions. I'll, I'll give you an example. Would you like to? I'm going to be talking a little bit about God. I'm not going to try to beat you over the head with it or anything like that but um, the person who presented the question to me was thinking about God when he asked me the question so I am going to mention God a few times for those of you who are atheists or whatever I hope you won't run, run off and uh, instead when I, whenever I mention God if you're not if you don't believe in God just think about it, some other ultimate authority maybe it's science maybe science says whatever works for you for me, it's God, obviously. I'm a God-fearing person. But one thing I've noticed is that people fail to make distinctions. I did this all the time. I remember doing this all the time, the whole time I was living with an emotional disorder. And one of the major aspects of uh, curing myself of the disorder was learning to make distinctions that before I had never been taught to make. But I was going to give you an example. And the example I would give you is this. Does God hate people? Is, is there anybody on the earth that God hates? Well, it, it, all the research I've done points to the fact that he hates what people do, but he doesn't hate people. And when I was going through my own recovery, 
you know, this was a the reason why there was such a big breakthrough is because I remember times in many long periods of time in my life where I would sit and I would be filled with hate. And it was because of my father's abuse. And it was very confusing for me because I felt like I loved my father at the same time simultaneously I was filled with hate. I could not figure out, do I hate my father or do I love my father? And it was very confusing, you know, if you can imagine, being 10 years old, 12 years old, 15 years old, trying to work that out. Feel like I hated my father, and then I'd immediately feel shame for that, for, for the hate that I was feeling, which is interesting, because that was a big part of my problems, believing that what I feel could be right or wrong, good or bad. And that feeling was something I was doing so that I, I could be held accountable for it. You know, So from my perspective, it was wrong to feel that. And because my father was involved with those feelings, I felt like I was doing something really repugnant, really disrespectful and, and unthankful. You know, I owe my life to my father. I owe my I owe lots of things to my father. What was what was my problem? What was the one problem that if I could have seen it would have fixed everything? I mean it would have made everything all right in my head. It would have made it all work. What was that thing? Distinctions. I wasn't making distinctions. I wasn't distinguishing between my father as a person and the things my father was doing you see why that's such a big deal it's a huge deal it's a huge deal because I can hate the things my father does all day long I can hate him it's not the same as saying that I hate my father I can love my father and hate what he does and every indication that I find in the Bible points to the fact that that's the way that God views people too. There are things that people do that he absolutely hates. There are qualities that people possess that he absolutely hates and, and will not tolerate indefinitely. But as far as people themselves, he loves people. In fact, the Bible talks about him hoping that uh, people will change change their ways. People will come to their senses. It says that he doesn't wish for anybody to be destroyed. He hopes for everybody to come to their senses and, and give up their wicked ways. So I was talking to this fellow, and he really hung up on this. We were talking about how there's only two value system types in the world. And I've talked about this a lot lately. You've got the commercial value system type. A lot of problems arise when we apply that to people, don't, doesn't it? because uh, you say well if my value works like a car or a Nintendo or something it can go up and down what really my value depends on when I believe that that applies to me that that value system type applies to me what it all comes back to is what do people think if people think good things of me my value goes up if they think negative things of me my value goes down but at all times what I know for sure, unconsciously, is that I am worthless. So I know we just talked about my value going up and down and everything. That, that's a, a contradiction, isn't it? Well, that's the contradiction that unhealthy people live with who live only live with the commercial value system type. They get a, a taste, a taste of value when people like them or people admire them or they, people are envious of their accomplishments they get a taste of value but the formula necessarily means that all the value is in what people think it's not in the thing itself the th in the commercial value system the thing itself does not provide value so which means that it itself is completely valueless then there's an, another value system type and that's the inherent value system type and that says that a thing is has value because of what it is uh, it, it, it its existence brings the value into the world and that applies to people applies to some other things I, you know we've talked a lot about that and uh, I'd be 
tempted to get uh, carried away. But let's not lose sight of what the conversation is about this week. It's about distinctions, making distinctions, how important that is. Uh, remember, one important distinction is thinking that God hates people. Well, he, he can't hate people. He talks about God being love. He, he loves people. He wants people to attain to a repentance. He, he's very patient with people. Uh, yeah, he talks about people as being wicked, uh, but he's describing people that way based on the choices that they make and the things that they do and their their heart condition rather than that being an inherent reality about those people they change their way then you know they can get right but uh, my buddy I'm talking to him about this and he's real hung up on it and he said he's having trouble figuring this out he said because he says God uh, values people more if they develop and live by certain qualities and he's right well, what does that mean for our inherent worth then because do you remember what I've said is that your inherent worth as a person is based on what you are your person you have inherent value because of what you are and interestingly if you take me and you and anybody else let's say Michael Jordan Michael Jordan we put Michael Jordan next to us uh, put Michael Jackson next to us I'm just gonna go through all the Michaels Michael Landon <laughs> it's probably before a lot of your time but um, you know what I'm saying let's take very accomplished people and let's just take the common person you know just normal guy like me and you and ladies normal ladies like you and you put us all side by side our value as people is equal nobody has more inherent value as a person than any other person right so then how how does this work God valuing people more if they develop and live by certain qualities well here's what hang, is hanging my buddy up it's his failure to make distinctions what distinction is he failing to make I'm going to help you out he's failing to make a distinction between identities so I want you to think about this I want you to think about what you are right so when I've said that your inherent value is based on what you are what am I referring to I'm referring to the fact that you're a human being but what other things are you have you ever thought of that what other things are you you see one of your identities more than one actually you've got a couple identities that are an inherent unchangeable permanent reality what does that mean it means you have no control or choice over it so take me as a human being I am a human being right that's what I am inherently I am a human being that's one identity that I have can I choose not to be a human being <laughs> no can't choose that it can't be changed that that's what inherent means it means it cannot be changed not only that but it's not up to me I, I have no choice or say in the matter at all I didn't choose to be a human it's just what I am I can't change it it's just what I am so that's an interesting thing about identities that are inherent truth about us we don't have any choice like uh, you know I can't tomorrow decide not to be that so think about other identities you have the one we just discussed is an inherent reality what about your other identities well most of the others are superficial temporary states so think about it in terms like this which which of your identities is an inherent unchangeable permanent reality it's it's inseparable from you and which of your identities are superficial temporary states you see with identities with those identities that we're describing right now that are superficial temporary states do you have control and choices over them yes you do see that that's a major difference between these and 
your identities which you do not have any choice or control over because they're inherent to you. Let's go back to you being a person. You being a person is a permanent, unchangeable reality. Can't change it even if you wanted to. You can't. You're either male or female. That also is an unchangeable, permanent reality. You can dress up and you can get surgeries and you can pretend otherwise, but that's all it would be. Pretending. Denial. Uh, which we see a lot of in the world today, don't we? But those, but people doing that can never truly, genuinely be happy. Why not? Because nobody living in denial, playing pretend, can be happy. Because underneath it all, they know the truth. See, it, I could pretend to be a dog. And I mean, I could get surgeries, I could do everything I want to do. And I could pretend and I can lie to myself and I can just wallow in denial for decades. But I will never be happy. Why not? Because I'm rejecting what I know to be true. So underneath, underneath, no matter how delusional I am about it, on some level I know the truth, that I am not a dog. And that is robbing me constantly of joy. Do you remember what the solution to that is? Think about this, that when you're, uh, like when I was going through my recovery, a big realization I had was that there were all these things I hated about myself that I was constantly running from. What was the source of a lot of my unha unhappiness? The source of a lot of my unhappiness was that I hated those things about myself and I was, re and I was denying them. I denied that those were parts of me. So I pretended them away, and I, try, and I tried to run from them and ignore them and pretend them away. But, again, what's robbing me of the happiness? That underneath all that, unconsciously or subconsciously, I know that those parts of me still are parts of me. And it just drives me nuts. So what was the answer then for me finding inner contentment? Was it to continue running from those things and denying them? No, the, the answer was the exact opposite. The answer was turning around and embracing the things I hated about myself. Turn, turning around, accepting realities about me that I wish weren't, weren't realities about me, but that they are, and they're unchangeable. And instead of running from them, turning around and embracing them and accepting those parts of myself, the good and the bad and everything, that brings contentment. So you can see why I say that a person who would like to be a dog and is trying to lie to themselves for 30 years and, and say, I am a dog, even with surgeries and all these things, they cannot be happy. Nobody living in denial can be happy. The answer is actually the exact opposite, to turn around and embrace what you really are. And people will twist that and say, oh, okay, it means he can be whatever he wants to be. Brace, brace what, he, what his feelings say he is. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying your feelings are telling you the lie. Your brain will tell you the truth. Your brain will always know the truth. And as long as you're rejecting the truth, you, you, will, not be, you will not find contentment. No matter how many people around you rally around you and support you in your delusion, you cannot be happy. Again, we're getting a little bit off track there, but we're talking about inherent truths about yourself, right? You're a person, you're either a male or female, that is an unchangeable permanent reality. No matter what you do to dress it up and pretend and all that stuff, one cannot change inherent realities and one is always on some level aware of this. So continuing to try to reject realities only leads to frustration and discontent, not, not inner contentment. However, you're also other things too, aren't you? You might be a doctor. You might be a psych psychologist. You might be a, a politician. Might be an artist. Might be lots of things. You might be a mother. A mother. On top of that, you might be a servant or a worshiper of God. Now comes the time where it's very important for us to make distinctions. Your identity and value as a servant of God is not an inherent reality. You ever think about that? Now, there's there's people out there who are really, really um, fanatical about their beliefs. It's still not a permanent reality about you. It's something you have a choice in. You can choose to be that or you can choose not to be that. 
See, anything you can choose or choose to be or choose not to be cannot be an inherent identity or a permanent condition. If you can choose to be it or not be it, it means that it can change completely. In fact, the fact that you can choose at all to be that thing or not is the dead giveaway that it's not an inherent truth about you. and It's not an inherent permanent condition. It's not inseparable from you. You know, there's many ways to say it. When I speak about inherent value and your value as a person, it has nothing to do with your value as a servant of God. And that, a lot of people get trapped up on that because they say a servant of God is a person, right? A worshiper of God is a person. A bank teller is a person. Yes, but that's the distinction you have to make. You have to make a distinction between them as a person and then as a subcategory identity that they might have. Why? Because one describes inherent realities, the other describes superficial, temporary states. One comes with choices, the other does not. The nature of both, the, the, the nature of how both work are completely different. The two distinct value system types is not where my buddy or impossibly you are having trouble marrying the different concepts that I talk about as far as the two, there's only two value system types that exist in the world and that sort of thing. Rather, it's in a person's failure to recognize the various quote-unquote identity types that we all live with. I, I have more than one identity type. I, I am a person, but I have other identities too. I'm a father. I'm a, an emotional health consultant. You know, I'm, a, I'm an internet personality. I'm, I'm lots of things. The nature of my value as a father, a worshiper of God, a bank teller, does not operate the same as my value as a person, that is to say a human being. That is an aspect of what I am in an inherent sense, in an inseparable sense from me. <clears throat> and I have no choice in that one way or, or another. So valuing somebody more than other people or less than other people for the qualities that they possess does indeed fall into the commercial value system as I call it. If you take me and anyone else and you put us together and you value us as people or the ultimate authority that as you understand it, God for me, God views me standing next to you and you know, a dozen other people. He's valuing what I am as a person, my inherent reality about me, what I am. He's valuing that, but then he's also distinguishing my qualities, the qualities that you and I and all of us possess and our, our intentions, our heart condition and those sorts of things, and he's valuing that also. So you have value as a person. In addition to that, you, you possess certain qualities, and those qualities have have their value don't they some people may possess those qualities and some may not remember that your superficial temporary identities these are things like father friend banker surgeon so forth your value as those things can rise and fall remember they're not inherent to you and another th important thing to remember about that is that your value as those things depend on your performance as those things. So if I'm a baker, the fact that I'm the, just the fact that I'm a baker does not provide me value. Or let's say it doesn't provide me greater value than another baker. What does provide what does provide me greater value or lesser value as a baker compared to another baker? It's how well I bake, right? What what would a baker be? Is that my prime identity? Like, no, it's a, it's a subcategory. It, it's an identity that I have a choice in. It's an identity describing a superficial temporary state. I could retire at any time. Heck, I could drop out and I could go and become a brain surgeon. I could become a Supreme Court justice. You see, and even those things, even the elevated identities are superficial temporary states. They don't describe an inherent anything of anybody. So think about that. We all have subcategory identities in addition to human being. And most of them are not inherent realities about what we are.
Now, somebody in our group re- replied this way, said when re- reading what I just described to you all folks, she says, I have an understanding of God's value of us. We are all more valuable to him than we can imagine. That is true. That is true. In fact, he has gone tremendously out of his way to demonstrate that and has paid personal costs, great personal costs, to demonstrate that. She says, no matter what we do, right or wrong, that doesn't change. She's right. Your value as a person does not change depending on how you live. Whether you live in a way that pleases God or you live in a way that displeases God, your value as a human being is constant. It does not change. Because remember, what is it based on? It's based on what you are. You're you're a human being. There are no other creatures like human beings. It's just human beings and then much inferior animals populating the reality we, we all exist in. She says, but we can do things that he is pleased or displeased with. And I actually, she, she's got it. She's got it. I misunderstood this originally when I read it, and I said, no, not exactly. But no, she's got it. She's got it. You see, it's important to make the distinguish, to distinguish the things that God does hate. He hates certain things you do. He can hate attitudes you live with. He can hate lots of things. Can't hate your feelings, Right because you don't have a choice in your feelings. But he can hate your thoughts. He can hate the thoughts that you choose to entertain. Make the distinct, distinction. Do you remember the, the kid who uh, shot up Uvalde? What did I say? I said that the kid needed to, what did he need, what distinctions did he not grow up making? He didn't grow up making a distinction between the things he does, the shameful things he does, and he himself as a person. How do we know? Because only a person who has grown up not making those distinctions can go off and do something so heinous. Why? Because he does not distinguish between what the things he does and what he is and who he is. You see, the healthy child would do a, a, a terrible thing and go, man, that was a terrible thing I did. Huh, really need to fix that. That's fixable, right? All I have to do is not do that thing anymore. I have to figure out why I did that thing in the first place and 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 change that so that I don't do it anymore. But the unhealthy kid goes, oh, I did a terrible thing. I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I'm a bad person. I did a bad thing. I'm a bad person. That's shame. But now the person is not distinguishing between what he did and what he is. So now he's walking around feeling like he is the problem. Is there any fix in that? No. So we come back again to the thing. Do you see how if you have an inappropriate view of what is inherent to you and what isn't, we talked about having an inappropriate view about things that you are not and saying, yeah, I am those things, right? That is damaging. It's terribly damaging. What did we say the result of that was? person can never experience contentment because they're rejecting what they unconsciously know to be true about themselves. But the opposite is just as damaging. When you view things that are not inherent to you as being inherent to you, that is just as damaging. When you don't make the distinction between things you're doing as being shameful and you being shameful. It's only destructive when you confuse those things, when you do not make the proper distinctions. What is the result of uh, doing something bad and not making the distinguish, not making a distinction between what you did and what you are? People who believe that they themselves are shameful will do shameful things. That's what that kid in Uvalde did. Because he says, why not? Why not? I'm a terrible person. I'm a terrible person. All these terrible things I've done is proof of it. What? Why shouldn't I do something terrible? Whether I do terrible things or not, I'm still terrible. So why not do terrible things? Isn't that interesting? Having an inappropriate view, that make, failing to make a distinction between inherent realities and non-inherent realities, or uh, failing to make a distinction between what we are and what we do, what we feel and what we are and what we do 
failing to make a distinction between those things, they're all different things. But the failure to make that distinction in any direction only results in terrible end results. On the one hand, person is just discontent for their entire life, confused, running from themselves, pretending, never happy. On the other hand, person doing shameful things because he says, I am shameful. Even if I were to do good all my life, I'm still a shameful piece of crap. <clears throat> so that would be a waste of time. Might as well just do, might as well just keep doing shameful, crappy things. So the Bible record makes it perfectly clear that God values some people more than others. Yes, he does. You know, if I were to say <laughs> King David is somebody I really admire and uh, he was a manly man made some real dumb blunders. I mean, he did some really terrible things. He he, he stole a man's wife, uh, had an affair with a man's wife, and and had him had the had the husband killed. Ends up getting her pregnant. Ends up marrying her. And I, you know, I've done some terrible things. I've never killed some guy's. I've never killed some guy's wife and and took his wife. Uh, but David did that did some really stupid things but at his heart he was a good person and uh, you know he could go out and fight in a war and come right back home and and write poetry and songs and stuff it was just a really remarkable person but you know if, if you were to say that God valued every single person in Israel the same as he valued David that wouldn't be that wouldn't make sense the, the facts don't seem to indicate that. Now, if God was only taking into consideration value as people, as what David was, he's a human being, and he were to line up all the Israelites and, you know, David next to the entire nation of Israel, as people, yes, they're all equal. But what made God value David more than all these other people? And did that change his inherent value? The answer is no. You can't change inherent value. Inherent value is constant. So remember that. All of us as people are working with a constant. We all have tremendous value as people. That's a constant, and it's equal for all of us. On top of that, I possess qualities that you don't possess, and you possess qualities that I don't possess. Some of those qualities that I possess have great value. Some of the va uh, qualities that you possess have great value. Some of the qualities that I am failing to possess have great value and because I don't possess those qualities that affects my overall value doesn't it it doesn't affect my value as a person but it affects my overall value in Noah's time God clearly valued Noah and his family much more greatly to, than he did any other people in the entire world at that time how do we know Well, <laughs> because he wiped everybody else off the face of the earth uh, Abraham was particularly favored or valued by God to the point that God considered Abraham his personal friend. How would you like to be able to say that? You like having rich friends? You like having rich friends? People who have a lot of, mo a lot of money? Who is richer than God? Everything belongs to him. Wouldn't that be nice? That, that's a, that'd be a pretty good thing. Uh, God loved Abel, but did not hold Cain in very high regard. God annihilated the entire cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and everybody in them, while going to extensive measures to ensure that Lot and his family got out alive. So it's clear that people can't just expect God to take them as they are while living any old way, any old way we want, with no regard whatsoever for God's feelings on things, God does value some people more than others. But remember, we're talking about overall value. If we're just talking about our inherent value as people, we're all on equal ground there. But then you add on top of that certain qualities, and those qualities have value. Um, and then your overall value changes, doesn't it? Not your inherent value, but your overall value. How does your and my inherent value work? How can it even be a real thing? It is real because God values us all as people. 
Um, but even if you're not a God fearing person, that you know, I know I told you I'd try to not talk too much about God, and it's really hard to do because this whole discussion is really intended for people who are struggling with that. Like, how, how does God view me if I have inherent value? At the same time, there are certain things I know I should be doing and that I shouldn't be doing. And, you know, how does that, how does it all work? Well, th- th- I really, this conversation is for you, but if you're not a, a religious person, if you're a, an atheist or something like that, inherent value, it, it's not like only people who believe in God can see its existence and understand it. What was that scientist, uh, Carl Sagan, all right? E- even Carl Sagan, who, from as, much, as far as I understand, was an atheist, even Carl Sagan would have no trouble understanding that if the only life that exists in the entire universe is on planet Earth, that the planet Earth has inherent value. Yeah, because the, the miracle of life only exists there. So you don't have to be a God-fearing person to understand the principle of how inherent value works. There, there's no such thing as people anywhere else. We are one of a kind. And so even if you're not a God-fearing person, on the merit of that alone, it shouldn't be too hard of a concept to understand and to accept. But back to uh, what we're talking about here. To say that God values us all as people that is to say as human beings equally is not the same as saying that he values us all equally in roles we play as human beings again distinctions matter for example what I am has different possible connotations it can refer to a permanent unchangeable truth such as I'm a person or it can refer to a temporary superficial state I'm a worshiper of God why am I a worshiper of God because I was born that way? No, by choice, I'm, I'm that. In the first example, I have no say in the thing. It's, it's entirely not up to me. It's a permanent, fundamental, unchangeable reality about what I am that can never change. For the second example, I do have a say in the thing. I get to choose whether to be that thing in the first place or not. Not only that, but my value as that thing depends on what? My value as that thing depends on how well I carry out that role. You can't say that about being a person or being a male or being a female. No, because that value, those values are based on the inherent value system type. The value comes with being that thing. But being a worshiper of God, the value doesn't come immediately. I I have to live up to that role. But your value as a human being isn't dependent on performance. Now, the reason why this is so hard for most people to wrap their heads around is that, as I I think mentioned earlier, earlier, a worshiper of God is a human being, and people go people struggle with that because they don't make the distinction. You're a person and you're a worshiper. You're a person and you're a baker. You're a person and you're a scientist. But your value as a person is constant and it's it's always there you see I am an emotional health consultant what else am I I'm also a human being that is to say a person do you see how both have independent value both come with independent value my value as an emotional health consultant is not related to my worth as a person they're independent Yes, as an emotional health consultant, I also am a person. But the nature of my value as an emotional health consultant is one thing, and the nature of my value as a human being is another thing. Emotional health consultant is not something that I inherently am. Human being is something I inherently am. Another way of saying it is that Emotional health consultant is not something that is inseparable from me. Human being is something that is inseparable from me. You can't have me without the human being part. You can't have me without the emotional health consultant part. As human beings, our inherent value is equal. Stand any of us up side by side. And our value as people is equal. And that's the way God looks down and sees you and me according to the way I understand it. The way I have worked it out 
and 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 the way that it harmonizes with everything else that I uh, have learned and share with you. All of us are on completely equal ground as far as that goes. Not one of us has greater or lesser of that value than anybody else. But on top of that, we each take on these other superficial roles and identities. You know, and the mix-up really happens, I think, we say, I am, I am this, I am that, I am this other thing. And maybe somewhere in our brain we say, well, then all of those work the same way. Nope, they don't. Remember, I am this might be an inherent reality about myself. I am this other thing might be describing a completely superficial temporary state. But you can think of these superficial roles and identities as subcategories of what you quote unquote are. And for these things, value is indeed based on the commercial value system, meaning that it's dependent on how well one fills the role. But on top of that, don't forget this, that for example, if I am a, a father, all right, that is a subcategory of what I am, and it's not inherent to me. I, ch- I had a choice, right? I had the choice to become a father or not become a father. And that could change. You know, heaven forbid, heaven forbid somebody's child were to die before they do. They would cease being a father, wouldn't they? As long as they don't have other kids. But my value as a father is not inherent to me just becoming a father. Like I become a father one day and suddenly my father, my value as a father is equal to everybody else's. No, I have to live up to the role of father. So there's one thing, the role, right? How well you fill the role. But remember that there are certain qualities involved with filling that role well that themselves possess inherent value. Yes, patience. Patience itself, the quality itself, possesses inherent value. Now what happens when I possess that quality? My inherent value as a person doesn't rise, but any observer could say, I'm trying to to appeal to you folks who who are uh, not God-fearing, any observer could look at me and value me as a human, but also value the qualities that I possess independent of my value as a human. So if I possess those qualities, I possess something of value, don't I? So the the qualities themselves can be valued, independent of what I am and who I am. Remember the, the opposite of that was when I was um, ha- hating, I thought I was hating my father. And what I realized was no, I'm hating the fa- things my father does, but I love my father. You see how that works? I can value the the qualities that my father is exhibiting. They themselves can have inherent value or inherent lack of value, independent of my father as a person. Well, that works with good qualities too. So any observer, let's say God, looking at you as a person, he sees your value as a human being, but then he also uh, sees the inherent value of the qualities that you possess. You see, he's able to detach from you and value the qualities themselves. And then overall, your value to him becomes greater. So take two mothers and stand them side by side to evaluate their value. One will have greater value than the other. Not as people, but as mothers. So all of us at all times are living with different identities, and some of those identities involve inherent value and others do not. My value as a bricklayer can coexist simultaneously with my value as a person, but they're not based on the same things. They're the nature of the two things are not the same, nor are they necessarily equal, right? <clears throat> so something to think about. Lots of different intertwined aspects to this discussion. And I hope that it helps you start making distinctions. Patience, great quality. It has inherent value on its own, independent of me. But I can learn to possess and demonstrate that quality. And any observer could say, well, I love uh, Brian as a person, and I I value those qualities that he possesses. Remember, I'm not my qualities. The qualities I possess are not inherent to what I am. 
I, I have to learn them and adopt them. And they themselves possess inherent great value, depending on the quality, right? All right, ladies and gentlemen, I about wore my throat out. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. You do something nice for yourselves, and uh, I'll see you over there on our exclusive group over on thelastsymptom.locals.com, or you can download the locals.com app and just search for The Last Symptom by Brian Barnett. Take care. So, uh, again, uh, now neighbors are all out having a powwow or something out in the street. <clears throat> but if you think about <laughs> Goodness gracious. What did I tell you? Sounds like somebody yanking his or her toenails out with pliers. Tell us where the secret code is. Tell us where the missile you is hidden. I won't tell you. Yap, yapper. Oh.